Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about corner detection, specifically Harris corner detectors, which are one of the simplest feature points that you can detect in an image and um, they are used in a bunch of different applications for template matching, for uh, object recognition and so on. So a corner is basically where two edges meet. So if I have a horizontal edge, let's say, and a vertical edge, then at the corner, I can expect that um, the properties of the two edges show up. And what are the properties of edges? If you watched my previous video on edge detection, you know edges are where the light intensity changes abruptly. It can be in the X direction or Y direction or in an, uh, at angle. But in general, uh, the way to detect an edge was using spatial derivatives, right? So if you have light intensity I, at the pixel X and Y, then the derivatives of I with respect to X and with respect to Y, you remember, these guys can detect different categories of edges. So this top one is good for a vertical edge, and this one is good for what? A horizontal edge. Now, if you are at the corner, you expect what? both of these entities to be large numbers, right? Because you have big changes in this direction and in this direction. Another way that Harris formulated this problem is this. He said, consider a window that has a corner in it, like this, right? If you want to look this patch uh, in an image, right, or compare it against another portion of the image, then definitely uh, you want, if you want to do template matching, which is actually one of our future videos, what you want to do is if you have a bigger image, and this image has all sorts of features in it, right? Let's say it has something like this, this one, this one, this one, and so many other things. He said, then what you can do is take this template and take it to the different positions of the image you are searching and see where the difference between this template and a window of similar size, let's say if you put this window here, it's gonna look like this. If you subtract these two and square it so that the negative and the positive entities would not cancel each other, then where is it that you have a good match for this edge? It is gonna be a window that the summation of the total differences, some squared error, right? This entity is minimal, right? So definitely here, it's not gonna be anywhere any good, but if you add, let's say, that feature right here, correct? Then, if you put that window right here, then some of the differences between these two is gonna be the minimum that you can get. Right, And this is very good and very revealing for an edge, but the problem is with, uh, with the corner, I'm sorry, but if I wanted to do the same thing and find an edge in an image, it wouldn't be this easy. Why? Because let's say you have a patch, a template of an edge, let's say vertical edge, and now I want to find it in, let's say, this image where it has this huge vertical edge. Where in this image I can say is the best match for this template? Well, I can put it here probably, or maybe I can put it here, or here, or here, right? 
it's not necessarily now for the top one and the bottom one might be a little bit better because they have a portion of empty area just like this one does the middle ones might not be as good but for it this top one and this bottom one are going to produce similar results so you can slide a edge uh, section along a bigger edge and you might never know exactly where this template is along the bigger picture but as I just showed you, if I want to repeat the same thing for a corner, I know if I put that window all over the place, definitely here for this guy, that is going to be the minimum and nowhere else. So that's the good property of a corner that it is quite distinguishable from the um, other parts of an image if you want to do a um, template matching okay and that's one of the reasons we use corner points as uh, some of the reliable features now there are some uh, much better features and feature descriptors which as i said it's one of our future videos we talk about new types of features harris is kind of the simplest thing for a template matching object recognition and tracking and so on but uh, you see why a corner is a reliable uh, entity. Now, so here if we expand this sum squared error, um, what I can do is for here, which is the um, portion in the image that you're looking where from the current location you have shifted so many pixels to the right or left, and from the same vertical position, you move so many pixels up and down, right? Because you have to move that window all over the image to find the best match. So you have to slide it horizontally and slide it what? Vertically, and these are shown with delta X and delta Y. So that's, that's what we call the sliding window. So for this sliding window, I can use a Taylor expansion and I say I at X plus Delta X and Y plus Delta Y can be approximated by what? By I at X and Y plus partial derivative of I with respect to X times Delta X plus partial of i with respect to y delta y right and then neglect the higher order terms correct so i just go with what with the first order expansion of taylor and so now when you subtract these two this i and this i would go away and you are basically squaring this entity which you can see here and when I expand it, I can write it as delta x delta y times a matrix M times delta x delta y. I can write it as a quadratic form where this delta x delta y is the displacement vector and this M is your positive uh, definite matrix, which is basically what? You know, when you square this, the uh, partial of i with respect to x will be squared. The partial of i with respect to y will be squared and you will you will have two i x i y which you can see half of each term here and here so this is going to be your m matrix that you see in that top equation and um, as you clearly can see the components of this matrix are what first partial of i with respect to x square term of it the product of i x i y both on the on, uh, off diagonal and then i y squared again on the diagonal and these calculations are done for over the pixels inside the sliding window which you can see with w correct so you get this m matrix now uh, what kind of property does this uh, important M matrix have? Well, uh, here, this M matrix is clearly a 2 by 2 matrix. So it has two eigenvalues, right? Lambda 1 and Lambda 2. Now, what are the important properties about this Lambda 1 and Lambda 2 for the M matrix? 
Well, if you calculate it, Stimps M matrix, for a window around an edge instead of a corner, what's going to happen? For an edge, let's say it's a vertical edge like this, the partial of I with respect to X is going to be a large entity, while the partial of I with respect to Y is almost zero. Okay, it's a very small entity. If you want, I can show it much smaller than one. So when that is the case, correct, what's going to happen? This M matrix that you have is going to have a huge number here, kind of moderate numbers on the off diagonal and almost zero here. And so from the two eigenvalues of it, one of them is clearly is going to be a very large uh, entity and the other one is going to be very small. And that's what you can see here, right? That your lambda 1 is going to be much, much bigger than lambda 2 and we can call it what? A vertical edge. Similarly, for a horizontal edge, partial of I with respect to Y is going to be big and partial of i with respect to x is not going to be too big. So again, your matrix is going to be like a zero here almost, a very, very big number here, and then some moderate numbers here. So lambda 1 associated with this is going to be very small. Lambda 2 is going to be much bigger, which is this case. And that is a horizontal edge. For a flat region, both of these partial derivatives are almost zero. So all entities of your matrix are going to be very small, and so both of your eigenvalues are going to be very small. On the other hand, for a corner, which you can see here in this green region, both of these guys are what? Very big. Both of these uh, partial derivatives. So both of your eigenvalues are going to be large numbers. And that's what you see. So if I want to uh, look at the eigenvalues of this M matrix, and based on that, say what kind of pixel or what kind of entity I have inside my window, I have to look at the uh, relative size of the eigenvalues. If they are both very small, it's a flat region. If one of them is dominant, one of them small, one of them quite bigger, it's an edge. And if both of them are big and quite similar in magnitude, that's a corner. Now, how can I do that exactly? Uh, should I go ahead and just have some threshold below which I call an eigenvalue small or above which I can call the eigenvalue big? Well, it turns out you can combine these two eigenvalues into one single measure, and that is what you can see here. Lambda 1, lambda 2, the product of the two eigenvalues, minus a constant k times summation of the two eigenvalues squared. This entity, which you can also say is determinant of m, right? Because determinant of m is the product of the eigenvalues, minus k times. And you know, trace of a matrix is sum of the eigenvalues. So instead of this entity, I replace it with trace. Instead of this entity, I replace it with determinant, and that's directly coming from linear algebra. So if I calculate determinant of a minus k times trace of m squared for a specific k, in which empirically it has been determined that a number between 0.05 and 0.06 is a good number, then this number R can be a good measure of what kind of entity I have in my uh, window. So let's take a look at that. Well, if it's a flat region, what can happen to this R? Well, clearly, when it's a flat region, Let's say, for example, your lambda 1 is like 0.1 and your lambda 2 is like 0.2, some small numbers. 
or it could be even smaller. Clearly, when you multiply, it's like 0.02 minus, let's say k is the middle number, 0.05, times summation of the two, which is 0.03 squared. Clearly, you see this number is going to be very small number, whether positive or negative, it is going to be small. Correct? So whatever it is, this number is going to be close to zero. If it's an edge, whether per, uh, vertical or horizontal, let's say your lambda 1 is now like 10, your lambda 2 is 0.1. What's going to happen here? Right? So this is your R. Your R is going to be what? The product of the two minus 0 0.05 times summation of the two squared. And guess what number here you get? This is 1. This is what? Negative 0.05, if you use math lab, right? So 1 minus 0.05 times 10.1 squared, right? The number is negative 4.1. Let me just write the number. Four point one. Okay, so clearly you see the number is negative. And if you repeat it for the other, like lambda 2 is big, lambda 1 is small, or change the relative the magnitude between them, make this lambda even bigger, lambda 2 smaller, you see it even becomes a bigger and bigger negative. So the bigger the difference between the two lambda is, this number r is going to go and become a bigger negative number, or in general, we say the magnitude of it, or the uh, r becomes a smaller, right? On the other hand, when two numbers are close in magnitude, so let's say lambda 1 equals 10, and let's say lambda 2 equals 8. If you calculate r here, this is going to be like 80 minus 0 0.05 times 18 squared. Let's calculate this number as well. So 80 minus 0 0.05 times what? Um, 18 squared. You see, 63.8, big positive number. So what's the difference? The difference is the sign. For edges, it's a big negative number. For corners, it's a big positive number. For flat regions, it's around zero. So now I can only look at what? The biggest values of R in the region, right? And if that biggest number that you see is still what? It's a negative number, definitely you neglect it. If it's zero, you neglect it. If they are big positive numbers, you consider them as a, what? An edge, a corner. Okay, so that's now how you can detect a corner point. Uh, now, a few things here, since you are doing partial derivatives and you're taking derivatives, you need to make sure your original image from which you're reading the light intensities is not... Uh, showing noise. If it does, which most of the images do, you need to what? First apply a Gaussian filter. So before you really calculate Ix and Iy, a good strategy is what? To first filter the image with some Gaussian filter and then instead of doing Ix, you do what? You do partial derivative with respect to x of g convolved with i. So first do a convolution of the Gaussian filter with any fil filter size and sigma that you want. Uh, smoothen the image, then take partial derivative. And the same thing for partial of y. Okay, so you need to make sure that you're not taking derivatives from the noise. The other thing is, um, when you have a corner point, at the corner point, you might have several candidates. So you might get a big number here, 
Let's see if I can draw on it. You might have one big point here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, here, here. So one of the other things you can do to improve your um, edge map, uh, your corner map, is called non-maximum suppression, which is basically look in a window that is moving in a sliding window as you move it all the way from top to bottom, left to right. And in each window, you try to only keep what? The maximum number. If this is the maximum, I keep that. Here, the same thing. If I have several candidates for a corner point, I look at the maximum and I only keep that, okay? So if you do that, you can reduce the number of your potential corner points detected and make your um, edge map a little bit improved. So here I have written a demo code for you. So here I read a, a chessboard image. And first you see I'm applying a Gaussian filter with filter size 5 and sigma of 2. I smoothen the image. And then here I'm using the Sobel filters, which are kind of common for taking the derivatives. Okay, so those IX and IY, I use these um, filters for taking derivative of IX and IY. I, I, all I need to do is to convolve my window with KX and KY to give me IX and IY. And if you look at these windows, they are size 5. Uh, many other people use size 3. You can do that. And um, when you do that, pay attention that it's only the middle part of your convolved um, window that for which you are calculating IX and IY, okay? If I show you this KX here, look, it's only here, the middle column, the third column for which I'm calculating IX. And similarly, when I do KY, it's only the middle row, row number 3, for which I calculate IY. So when I go here and it says summation of IX values that belong to the window, here, look at this. I should not really calculate the result of what? The convolution of this kx with all of the 5 by 5 sliding window that I have because when I convolve this kx with the 5 by 5 window and I use the keyword same it gives me the result which is also a 5 by 5 now should I add all of those 5 by 5 25 values right to get the first entry no because all I'm doing, I'm taking partial of, with respect to x, of the middle number. So when I convolve, again, kx, I have a window. Let me write it down for you. I have a window. This window is size 5 by 5. I convolve it with kx. It gives me a new window, let's call it W prime. Or you might call it W of X. Okay, now for this W of X, 5 by 5, should I add all 25 numbers to get this? Absolutely not. Because whatever this one is, only this middle column has been taken X derivative from. These other ones here, 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 and here, they have not really been taken X derivative from. So when I said sum it, I only do the summation over this column, not the whole window. Okay? When I move this window one unit to the right, now this one becomes the center column. So then I would add those numbers together. Okay? So please uh, pay attention to this part. And... Um, that's what you see I have done. I have taken uh, X and Y derivatives. And here you see I'm only taking summation of the middle column or the middle row here. I calculate the M matrix. I calculate that um, 
uh, R. You can use 0.045 or 6. It doesn't matter. I can go with 0.05. And here I have done a non-maximum suppression. I only keep the maximum. I put everything else to zero. And I give you the um, final edge map, which here I converted to a binary image. And I, again, still in it, I keep the maximum so many. Uh, MATLAB has also a, a Harris corner detector for which the command is detect Harris features. Or there is a, another command, an older command called corner, which you can use. So you pass to it the image, it detects the corners, and then you say keep the strongest 50, the strongest 20 corners, the strongest 10 corners. So you say corners, which is the output of this, it's a structure, dot, select strongest. This is a, a field in that structure, and you provide the number. Select only the 50 strongest corners. You take their location here, and here I um, basically put those notations as red star onto the top of the chessboard for you. So here, when you run this code, you're going to see two different uh, corner um, maps. One of them is mine. The other one is from MATLAB. Okay, so let's go ahead and run it. Here we go. So this is MATLAB, this last one. And it only selected the best. Now, uh, when you don't smoothen the image, in this case, it gives you actually a lot better results. Okay? It gives you a lot better results when you don't smoothen this um, chessboard image. And the reason is that chessboard image that I used is not a real image that you captured with the camera. It doesn't have any noise. So when you smoothen it, you're kind of reducing the uh, uh, dominant feature of the lambdas for M matrix for a corner. And so some of these corners, it misses them. Okay. For me, actually, for my method, if you see this is the original, uh, it's, this is the image and... Um, Seems like I just closed it. Let me bring it back here. This is my corner points. Okay, which you clearly see they easily match the corner points of the inner part of the chessboard. Still, at some corners, you have more than one candidate. Although I have done maximum suppression, but uh, seems like the window size you can even because here I still use the same window size of 5 when I do my um, uh, non-maximum suppression, okay? And remember here I have another parameter that I can change, only keep this parameter for me is similar to this 50. I'm only using those that are bigger than 40% of the maximum. Okay, so when I make this number bigger, you're going to see more points uh, smaller, when I make it bigger, you're going to lose a bunch of points, right? But you clearly can see that I can detect the corner points. Again, there might be some, uh, several points at the same corner, like two or three, as you can see here. You can do further processing on it, further tune the parameters, do morphological operators, and get what? Get it to do even better. But uh, I will share this code with you. The link for it to download it, you can see it under video description, and hopefully I could introduce the notion of Harris corner detectors to you, which are later going to be important for us to uh, do template matching, object tracking, object recognition, and so on. And not recognition, object detection. Okay, thank you so much. I will see you in my next video.